Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build, raster generator programming. I'm Dr. Mad Regan. In some previous videos in this series, we built a raster generator out of discrete components. The first raster generator was very fixed in its function. The last video, I made the raster generator out of an EEPROM. This is completely programmable. Here we can see the raster generator is basically an EEPROM, and the output from the EEPROM is captured by the flip-flops and fed back into the address bus. And the reason we can do this is that the 6502 and the raster generator share access to the memory. The CPU can use the memory while character clock's high, and the raster generator has access to the memory while clock's low. And then we simply hook up a shift register to the data bus, and this produces our pixel stream. The EEPROM I'm using for this build is the 27C322. It's a 32 megabit part with 2 meg addressing and 16 bit output. The output from the EEPROM is captured with two octal D type flip flops, and this number points to the current screen location of the raster scan. When clock's low, we read from the SRAM and latch this into the shift register. But at the same time, we're also fitting this value back into the raster generator EEPROM, and at the current address, is stored the value of the next address. This is output from the EEPROM and latched into the flip flops on the rising edge of clock. The flip flops now hold the next raster address, but while clock's high, the CPU has access to the memory. Then, on the falling edge of clock, the raster generator takes control of the address bus and the cycle starts again. Following the NTSC standard, our display is 65 bytes wide and 262 lines high, and there needs to be an EEPROM entry for each of these locations. It turns out that the vast majority of entries in the EEPROM just point to the next location in sequential memory. So to start with, I'm going to make this the default setting for the entire EEPROM. I've set up a project in Visual Studio called Composite Video, and the important thing to note here is I haven't written any of this code. This is just the auto-generated code when you start up a project. The first thing I usually do in these projects is change this get message into a peak message. That's because get message is blocking, so the system will just sit there waiting for an input, whereas peak message is polling. This means I can add code to the main loop, and it won't be waiting for an input. So far, so good. I'm going to set up a second file called Composite Video Generator. This will contain the bulk of the code that actually does the work, and I'll make it available on my GitHub page, links below. Actually, I've called it compositefsa.cpp. For now, I only need a 64K region within the EEPROM to make the raster generator. So I'm going to set up this variable, compositefsa, which will eventually hold the data that I want to be programmed into the EEPROM. The first thing I want to do is just step through every memory address and assign a value in the array equal to the next memory address. Ending it with fffs means that it should wrap around at the end of the 64K boundary. Next, I need to generate a file that I can use with my EEPROM programmer. And yes, I know it's from the prehistoric age, but I still prefer fopen. Check that the file was generated and return if not. Now generate a counter that can go through all the memory locations. Read each value. And it turns out the EEPROM programmer likes the data in little endian format. One of the things I did in the build was reassign the data pins on the EEPROM. I've used the native layout of the 27C322 before, and I just found it really hard to debug. So what I've done is reorder the outputs. Now, I'm allowed to do this if I want. I just need to make a correction from the data bits in the array to the data bits in the EEPROM. If I do this, that just means that the pins increase in consecutive order around the chip, and this is much easier to debug. I like to joke with young engineers that the build takes 90% of your available time and the debug takes another 90%, so you need to make debug as simple as possible. This code will reorder the data bits in the EEPROM, and once it's written, it's kind of set and forget. I've used the term swizzle for this process, and I think I inherited that term from my time working at NVIDIA. I did have a quick look on the internet, and the term bit swizzling is used but it seems more colloquial rather than being a formal term. Let me know what you think below in the comments. And now I just need to call this swizzle function with the data before I write it into the EEPROM. 
and now I'll just call this function once during the initialization of the main program. I'll load the Rust generator FSA into the EEPROM programmer. I have a TL866 programmer, which I really like, but it doesn't support the 27C322. So I had to buy the adapter board, and we need to tell the software that it's programming a 27C4096. I want to see if this works, so I'm going to adapt the code for the Arduino developed in part 7. Great, this still works. I'm going to add another signal to the Arduino. For testing, I want to be able to control the output of the raster generator flip-flops directly. I'll use port J0 for this. I'm going to disenable the RAM, but enable the ROM containing the Pac-Man code, and enable the raster generator flip-flop outputs. Now I'm going to change the bus enable signal to be low. This will give the raster generator exclusive access to the address bus. Now I'll compile it and see how it goes. Remember that this code reads the address bus and the data bus every clock cycle, and as far as I can tell it's just sequentially stepping through memory. That's all good and well, but now I want to see if I can get something vaguely resembling Pac-Man to come up. I'm going to disable the code that writes the long form of the address, and just enable the code that sends the raw data. Now using the PC display code, let's see if I get anything. Well that didn't work. I know the ROM containing the code for Pac-Man contains an image of the maze, and the raster generator so far just counts up, but it should sweep through this part of the memory, and therefore I should be able to transport it across the USB via the Arduino and display it on my PC display. I'll just change the code so I can select either raw data or formatted data. I just cleaned up the code a little bit. Let me check it again. That looks good. Ah, caught ya. There's the problem. This piece of code, checking that bit 3 of port D is low, is actually making sure that the CPU is trying to write to the memory. But we're holding the bus enable signal low, and there's a pull-up resistor on the read-write signal. So this condition will never be met. Let's get rid of that and try it again. Success. Excellent. This means the video finite state machine is sweeping through the memory at least once. So far, I've effectively just built an up counter, but I want to treat the regions of the screen differently. I'm going to break it up into three regions. Here, the blue region is the active area, and it's 40 bytes wide and 192 lines high. And I'm going to place this starting at location 2000 hex, which is where the high res image for page 1 is stored. This red region on the right is for our horizontal porch and I'm going to reserve it for all 262 scan lines. This region is 25 characters wide, so it actually takes up about 6.5k, and I'm going to somewhat arbitrarily locate this starting at 6000 hex. Finally, the green area is the vertical porch above and below the active display. It's 40 characters wide and 70 lines high, so it takes up just under 3k. I'm going to locate this starting from 0 hex. And now this is the tricky bit. I want to generate a stitch line which connects the green and the blue area to the red area. And I'm going to do this by modifying the jump location at the end of each line. For example, when I reach the end of the active area of scan line 1, I'll be at 2027. And now I want to jump somewhere into the 6000 page, which represents the horizontal blank region. The other thing I want you to notice is that for the second active scan line, I start at location 2400 hex. And that's because of the sweep pattern Steve Wozniak generated. After that, we go to 2800 hex, then 2C00, and so forth. I want to parameterize the raster generator code as much as possible. Hopefully, this will make it usable in other projects. I want the raster to sweep through the memory in the correct order. I need a function that can make a correction for Woz's addressing scheme. So, the first thing I need to do is take the lower three bits of the line number and multiply it by 400 hex. Then I want to take the next three bits of the line number and move them so that they start at 80 hex. Then finally, I want to take the upper two bits of the line number and multiply it by 28 hex. This function takes in the line number as a parameter and returns the memory address corresponding to the start of that line. This is equivalent to the hardware we built to map a raster generator address into a physical address. Let's look at this stitch line in a bit more detail. We want to connect the right hand side of the green box, which is locations 39, 79, and 119, and so forth, to the left hand side of the red box, 
which location 0, 25, 50, and so forth, all the way down to 17, 25. I apologize for all the magic numbers, and I'll try and parameterize it in the code. To perform the left sided stitch, we need a for loop to step through all 70 lines in the vertical porch. We want to compute all the right edges of the green box 39, 79, 119, and so forth, and connect them to locations 0, 25, 50, 75, etc. within the red box. So far, so good. Now we want to connect the right-hand side of the blue box to the remaining left-hand side of the red box. And this is where it gets tricky. We need to take into account the line ordering that was used in his mapping. So while we can just keep increasing the address by 25 in the red box, we need to use the generate line address function to figure out where to connect it to in the blue box. So we need to count it to step through the 192 active scan lines. I've cut and pasted the for loop from above, and now I just need to modify it. Here's where I use the generate line address function. Now I'm going over this math very fast, but I've provided a link to the code below, so you can review it at your own pace if you want to. Indeed, I would encourage you to do it. The left stitch is done, so now let's look at the right stitch. To start with, I want to connect the right hand side of the red box to the left hand side of the green box, but down one scan line. So locations 24, 49, and 74 within the red box will connect to locations 40, 80, and 120 within the green box. I'm going to cut and paste some of the code from above to do the right sided stitch. Here I'm implementing the math to do that based on the diagram we just saw. And again, it's probably best if you mull over the math at your own pace. But essentially, I'm stepping down the right side of the red box and the left side of the green box. Next, I want to connect the remaining right side of the red box to the left side of the blue box, but one scan line down. I'm going to need to use the get line address function again, and this is so I sweep through the scan lines in the order I want them to be presented on the screen. I'll cut and paste the code from above again, but I need to change it to iterate down the remaining right edge of the red box. Then I'll use the generate line address function to iterate down the left edge of the blue box in the right order. There are two special cases I need to deal with. The first is when I step into the active area. This is pretty straightforward, it's just one line of code. And while I use generate line address with zero, I probably just could have put zero there. The second special case is just connecting the bottom right to the top left of the screen. Again, this is just a single line of code, but a very important one. I've run the code, and now I want to program an EEPROM with this raster generator sequence. I'll start the code running on the PC, and nothing. Back to the same debug routine, I'll adjust the Arduino code to output a more human readable form of the data. That's odd. I don't see any addresses between 2000 and 3FFF. Ah, uh, that's the problem. I'm adding active base address twice. Once when I do the stitching, and again in generate line address. Fortunately, that's pretty easy to fix. Compile the code and run the EEPROM programmer again. Test it. That looks much better. I'm getting all these reads in the right 2000 to 3FFF range. Now I'll try setting the raw data. To help see what's going on, I've written some code that clears the screen whenever we hit location 2000 hex. Hmm, that's still not working. There's a problem, I'm ordering the data with 7F. Not quite sure why I did that. Excellent, there we have it. Then we can see we're scanning through the frame time after time. It's not getting lost or locked. So I'm pretty confident this is a circular path. We've got the raster generator sweeping through memory the way we want, and now we need to add the sync signals. You'll remember that we need one horizontal sync signal per scan line, and this causes the electron beam to move from the extreme right to the extreme left of the screen. 
In NTSC, this signal is meant to be 4.85 microseconds wide. With our 7.158 MHz start clock, we can approximate this to 35 pixels, which is exactly 5 characters. And what I want to do is run this horizontal sync signal right down the middle of our horizontal porch. But I need a physical signal that I can send to our voltage divider and emit a follower circuit. I could set up some wide 8 bit NAND gates and other combinatorial logic and detect when I'm in an H sync region. This would be a crazy circuit. Some of you might have noticed though that I'm only using the lower 32k of the address space. We have a 64k address space, so the upper 32k is unused. So, what if I use this same addressing for the horizontal sync signal, but I set bit 15? This will move the address from the 6000 range to the E1000 range, but only for the horizontal sync signal itself. This means I can use bit 15 out of the EEPROM as my H sync signal. First, I'm going to mirror the lower 32k and the upper 32k of the address space. But if I am in the upper address space, I want to keep circulating around there. So rather than going back to zero at the end of the frame, I want to go back to 8000 hex. So when copying the data, I just need to add 8000 hex to the next location address. Now I need another two stitch lines to add in my H-Sync signal. For every scan line in the red box, at the right position where I want to start the H-Sync signal, I want to jump from the 6000 address range up to the E1000 address range. Now the math does get a bit hairy here, and essentially I'm computing the start of the sync pulse, but I encourage you to look at the code and convince yourself. What I'm doing here is taking the H sync position and adding 8001 to it, and the 1 is so that we're constantly counting up with the lower bits. Now I need to deal with the negative edge of the H sync signal, which is where I step from the E1000 address range and go back to the 6000 address range for the rest of the scan line. Again, I need to add 1 to make sure that the lower bits are still counting up. And again, I'd encourage you to study the code and even compile it and run it and see how it works. We also need the circuit to generate the vertical sync signal. This is required once per frame, and it causes the beam to sweep from the bottom back up to the top. It occurs in a vertical porch, and in NTSC, it needs to be about 400 microseconds wide. So, this is the equivalent of about 7 or 8 scan lines. Just as I put H sync in the middle of the horizontal porch, I want to put V sync in the middle of the vertical porch. Now I could put the address for this region up above 8000 hex, and that would work. But I'd have to do a bit of modification to the existing H sync signal. Specifically, I'd have to make sure it doesn't jump back below 8000 during V sync. Previously, I suggested that we use A15 off the EEPROM to generate our sync signal. But there are a few other signals we need as well specifically the active signal, and in a couple of videos time when we work on the colour circuit, we're going to want a colour burst signal, and we also need to make one of the characters in the scan line 8 pixels wide instead of 7 pixels wide. What I'm planning to do is actually tap off three address lines, video address 13 through video address 15, and run them through their own flip-flops. I can't just use the existing flip-flops they're connected to, because they're connected to the address bus and they get turned off whenever clock's high. This would cause our H sync and V sync signal to oscillate at our character clock rate, but adding in another flip flop should make these signals stable. The output of this flip flop then goes into a 74HC138, and this is a 3 to 8 decoder. If I take the 8th output, this will go low whenever the video address is in the range E1000 to FFFF. So I'm going to use this as my combined sync signal. But it also means I can tap off 2000 to 3FFF, which is my active signal. And I can also tap off a color burst and a wide character signal. So, what I'm going to do is place our VSync signal right at the top of the addressing range from FA100 to FFFF. This means our sync signals will be in the range of E1000 to FFFF. The region above FA100 should still just be an up counter. So, I just need to redirect the character immediately before VSync up to FA100. So, I multiply the VSync position by the width of the horizontal porch. I subtract 1 to get the character beforehand, and I add all of that to the horizontal porch base address. And then I just reassign the value there to be FA100.
which is VSync base address. I want to stay in this address range for eight scan lines. So I multiply VSync width by total width, subtract one to get the character beforehand, and add it to the VSync base address. I reassign the value to be the vertical sync position and vertical sync width, multiplied by the active width, which is the same as the vertical porch width. Compile and run. All right, let's see how we go. Looks like we're good. So currently the raster generator is being controlled by the Arduino. Next video, I'll generate the clock circuit and we can start the bring up after that. But that's it for now. So remember, like, share, subscribe.